I gotta ask you, uh, what is the, what's your take on the people saying that you're hard, you're hard to be in a band with? That I'm hard to be in a band with? Yeah. Who says that? People. Really? Just peeps. Um, I'm not saying they said it yesterday, but I'm saying they said it a long time ago. They did. No one from my bands, though. <laughs> if you're in my band, I think I've... Listen, I was the difficult child. That's what I mean. In Jawbreaker, originally. Yeah. But now I've become kind of the mellowest guy in the band. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. But we we all, I think, marvel at it in our own ways that everyone's role shifted since we've been back together. Well, it's got, something's got to shift, right? I guess so. I just didn't think I would be the voice of the mild voice in the room. Welcome to What in the Duck Podcast. I'm your host, Oliver Peck. What in the Duck Podcast is proud to be sponsored by Dream Machines of Texas. www.dreammachinesoftexas.com All your used motorcycle wants and needs all in one place at www.dreammachinesoftexas.com They have multiple locations with large inventory and get new bikes in every week. Knowledgeable staff with great service and financing and extended warranty options available. They also have a complete service garage so every bike is gone through and brought up to speed before you hit the road. I have bought more than a few bikes from Dream Machines over the years and I could not be more satisfied. I've also had friends from all over the country buy bikes from Dream Machines because they couldn't find a better deal anywhere. You can buy a bike and have it shipped to you anywhere in the U.S., why buy a brand new bike with that brand new high price when you can get a like new bike with that dream deal you've been looking for? Go to www.dreammachinesoftexas.com and get a bike and get your ass on the road. All right, everybody. Welcome to another episode of What in the Duck podcast. Uh, this episode uh, is, for me, very exciting. I got a very, uh, very eclectic guest singer songwriter um insane person one of my favorite blake schwarzenbach from the band jawbreaker also from the band jets to brazil um and uh since a child since a teenager jawbreaker has been one of my favorite bands and as soon as jawbreaker ended he went straight into jets to brazil and jets to brazil went straight into being my next favorite band and uh I was able to meet Blake a few years ago and through some common people and we ended up having some wild times. Uh, and he is a wild person. Uh, you listen to his lyrics. Um, there is uh, a mastery of genius and psychosis going on in, in what he's got. And it's just, it's, 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 it's amazing to, to listen to. It's amazing to, to be a part of. Um, and I, you know, there was an album called Dear You that there's people out there that it's their absolute number one favorite album of all time. And I'm definitely, you know, close to that. It's definitely one of the best records, um, in my life. Uh, so I'm stoked to have, uh, Blake here today. It's going to be fucking awesome. And, uh, as always, I'm going to answer a few questions from people email. If you have any questions you want me to answer. On the podcast, just email the questions to what in the duck podcast at gmail.com and um, maybe I'll get to them and just ask me something good, see what happens. Uh, today's first question is quick and easy. Um, Derek, Derek E is his name. Uh, I don't can't see what the full last name is because it's cut off. But uh, Derek E, he says, "What the hell do you use for that rad mustache?" And uh, you know, it's a it's a it's an odd question uh, that people ask me. Guys ask me about the mustache, and you know, that's for years this has been going on, and I'm kind of like, this is what ha this is where I've gotten to in my life. We're we're men talking about hair care products together. Uh, it's kind of funny, but. Yes, that is where we are. 
But I have been using the same mustache wax for many, 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 many years. I've had a mustache uh, a few times, four or five times. I've had it and grown it out for years, shaved it off, grown it back out, had it for years. Uh, the one, the I'm currently, you know, f I don't know how many years deep in this mustache, many, many years deep in this one, but all the mustaches and all the years I've been using the same mustache wax. I've sampled a few others and, uh, but this is the one it's Clubman by Panade. And it is, uh, it's in a little, uh, it's in a little silver tube with the green label with a little man with a top hat on it. And it, it just does the trick. It stays hard, stays crisp. It's not oily. It doesn't leak. It doesn't run all down your face. It's not like, um, I don't know if it's all natural. I don't know what's in it. It just, you put it on, you shape your mustache and it gets crisp and, uh, stays all day long. No problem. So if you got a mustache and you want to keep it nice and crispy, get you some Clubman by Pinod. This is a non-paid advertisement for Clubman by Pinod. The best mustache wax I've ever used in my life. Um, Next question, Josh Carr. Got a lot of questions Josh Carr has. We'll see how many of them I get to answer. Um, first, and he says, hey, Oliver, first and foremost, thanks for your influence. Uh, you know, I'm going to, I do appreciate it when people email me and, and, and give me flattery comments. I just feel weird reading the self-flattery out. Anyway, this guy thinks I'm the best and I'm cool and I appreciate it. Um, and thank you, Josh. I think you're the best too. Thanks for emailing in. But he has a, a question. He says, where did your love for motorcycles begin? How many do you own? Are there any that you've sold and regret selling? Who's your favorite tattoo artist? What's your favorite tattoo that you have done? And what's your favorite tattoo you've seen, you have, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of questions. First of all, how did my love for motorcycles begin? Um, you know, just something about motorcycles has always enthralled me. And as a kid, you know, my earliest memories, you know, I don't remember learning to walk. I remember learning to ride a bicycle. And once I got on a bicycle, I mean, that was like the greatest thing in the world. I was, that was my toy as a kid, you know, whatever. I didn't grow up in the age of the video games. It was like, it was second you get up, you get on your bike and you go ride and you just, you're free, you're in the wind. But every second that I was pedaling that bicycle from my earliest memories, I was dreaming of being on a motorcycle and I would see people ride a motorcycle by and I'm like, that's going to be me. And so all through my childhood, um, my parents got divorced. My dad moved all over the place. My dad was wild and crazy. Um, and my dad, uh, bought me motorcycles, dirt bikes and go-karts that I had at his place. My mom never knew about. So, as early as like 12 years old, I was riding motorcycles and go-karts and, you know, I'd come home hurt and have to say I fell down the stairs instead of crashing a go-kart or whatever it was. But, uh, <clears throat> I think my mom knows all these stories by now, so whatever. But, um, I just love motorcycles. And then as, so as soon as I got, I don't know, I was probably, I think as soon as I graduated high school, I bought a motorcycle and rode it over to my mom's house. And my mom's like, what are you doing? You, you don't. And I was just like, I've been riding motorcycles for years. And she had no idea. Um, and then from then on, it's pretty much cars and motorcycles. All I really cared about. Um, and I have bought a lot of motorcycles. I do own dozens of motorcycles, most of which are Harley Davidson's. Um, Harley Davidson's the greatest motorcycle in the world. Um, this is not a paid advertisement for Harley Davidson, but, um, the, here's the question. Are there any that you've sold that you regret selling? I'm what you call a reluctant seller. 
I can't remember ever selling anything that I didn't regret selling. I mean, if I hate, I'm, I'm what you call a hoarder. I have a lot of things. Um, I have most of my things. Like, what do you mean you have most of your things? Like, well, things. If I ever had them, I still have them. You know, all my shoes from high school. Yeah, I still got them. You know, I mean, I don't even have, I don't like most of my crap from my childhood. I still have the stuff that my family was going to throw away from my mom's childhood. I kept and still have. Um, there's a story. I was in, after high school, I had a bunch of stuff in the attic at my grandmother's house. And my mom and grandmother had a yard sale and they sold over of my shit. And I lost my fucking mind. I was like, you sold my, yeah, a bunch of t- boxes of toys. And like, you didn't care about that. I'm like, what? So I freaked out. Um, they sold a bunch of my, I had some Star Wars toys they sold and I was pissed. My uncle had some baseball cards they sold. He was pissed, you know? And so on an, in a tangent years later, like I've been throwing a fit about my mom selling these toys for years. And then for Christmas one year, my mom gives me like one Star Wars toy. And she's like, I'm so, and she had it in like, all she could afford was buy this one figure. Cause it was hundreds of dollars. You know, and she sold all of them for like 12 cents. And she, I was like, yeah, I told you. He sold it, you know, whatever. It was a whole big debacle or whatever. But, um, so yeah, I regret selling everything. I regret, but I mean, I do have a bunch of shit I need to sell now. And I know I need to sell it. And I am going to sell it, but I'm a hundred percent going to regret selling it. Um, because you sell it, you get the money, you spend the money, the money's gone, and the thing's gone. Then you just, you're just you at zero. Uh, there is a lot of people that have this feeling of cleansing when they get rid of stuff. I do not have that. I have the feeling of longing for the stuff that is gone. Um, <clears throat> next question. Um, what is your favorite Um you know, favorite motorcycle for me, I have a handful. I ride I ride a bunch throughout the week. I ride a different bike here and there. And um I have quite a few motorcycles that are in progress that need work, that are sitting there, been, you know, that are long-term projects. But I have a quite a few motorcycles that I ride regularly and you know, it kind of changes what's your favorite. Cause I do some little I fix something up or I change something or I, and I'm I'm constant process trying to get it back to being completely original. Um, so, I mean, I'm born in 71, so I have a 71 original paint, sparkling burgundy motorcycle that I've did a bunch of stuff to make, make it back to right. And that's kind of my favorite. But then I got this kind of on a, in a trade deal, I ended up with this 73 purple shovel head that I didn't plan on keeping but now, for some reason, it's one of my favorite motorcycles. I rode it yesterday, and it was awesome. Uh, so you never know what your favorite's going to be. Uh, who's my favorite tattoo artist? Um, it's hard to pick just one. And it's hard to pick just one with all the many eras of tattooing. Um, but first name that comes to mind is definitely Scott Harrison. Which I don't even know if that counts because he quit tattooing. So I mean, he's a he's a he's an ex tattoo artist. He's retired. He's not old enough to be retired, so he's not really a retiree. He's more of a quitter. So he just quit. Um, you know, when he called me and he said he was thinking about quitting tattoo, and I said, "Well, you know, better tattooers than you have quit." So, um, but he is to me. That's a true story. That's really what happened. But I love him. I love his art, and I have quite a few tattoos from him and his his art is just just as far as an artist he's probably my favorite artist so i should probably backtrack and say he's my favorite artist um and i have a lot of his original paintings and they're really cool i, I definitely 100 percent for sure have the largest collection of scott harrison originals for those of you out here think that you have more than me <laughs> no um i know there's a few people that have quite a few um, but I got you beat. Um, but favorite tattoo artist, 
you know, from different eras, from the time before me, um, Owen Jensen, you know, from the from the 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, Owen Jensen was amazing. Um, and then from the next era, people like Bob Roberts. Um, and then from my, you know, the, the era that taught me, Richard Stell, um, people that I tattooed alongside with and learned a lot from, Eric Mosky, Chris Trevino. Um, both those people really, when I was about, 10 years into tattooing really helped me take it to the next level. And uh, from the current era, people I travel and tattoo with now, Greg Christian. Um, is Greg Christian is probably one of the people I travel and tattoo with the most. And he is just, me and him kind of keep the same pace. And we go to a place and we just do a shitload of tats. <laughs> yeah, buddy. That's Ricardo and Fred chiming in. Um. And then also my partner, Dean Williams, was very inspiring, insane person as well. Um, as far as tattooers that are younger than me, there's so many that are so fucking amazing that just blow my mind. And, uh, you know, just too many to list, really. Um, favorite tattoo that I've done? You know, that's a very common question a lot of people ask me. And it's... It, there's no way to answer it. There's no way to answer it. I've done so many tats and, you know, I probably, you know, it's like I've forgotten, I've forgotten more than I ever knew. So I'm going to just pass on that one. And uh, thank you so much, Josh Carr, for your question. Hey, I got one more question and then we're going to get into this episode. This question from Mike Hines. And he says, what is the best Lucero tour story and uh for those of you who know or don't know there's a band called lucero um they're from memphis tennessee and for the last i don't know 15 more years they've been my favorite current band i've seen them more than any other band i've traveled with them more than i've traveled with a bunch of bands i've tattooed everybody Literally tattooed everybody that's ever even been in the band. There's like six members that aren't in the band that were in the band through times I tattooed them. And I've also been tattooed by every member of the band. So getting tattooed by them on tour is one of my favorite things. And uh I just love Lucero. But I would say my favorite, my favorite story, if I just have to tell one, it's not wild and crazy. But it's just a little bit more, it was just a special moment for me. It's like we're in Atlantic City and we're sitting on the tour bus and and everybody left the bus and Ben was just Ben the singer was there and he like grabbed his guitar and he's like, hey man, I've been writing this new song. I'm trying to get it worked out. I got it about halfway through. Like, what do you think about it? And he played this song and it was uh, Texas and Tennessee. And I just heard him like working it out and playing through it. And there's a couple of lines in there that just like fucking just break it down. And I was just like, and I'm sitting there while he's like trying to figure it out. And I was like, dude, I'm like, I'm just sitting here by myself in this fucking front of this bus with Ben learning the song. And it was so fucking cool. And, uh, you know, it's like one of those things. He plays that song a lot. And every time I hear it, I just think about that. And I, I saw it happen. And it was amazing. So if you love Lucero and you know that song, uh, hopefully you appreciate that story. Um, if you don't know Lucero and you like rock and roll, check them out. Um, Lucero from Memphis, Tennessee. They got like fucking 17 albums. Uh, and they tour a lot. So your chances of seeing them are pretty good. And, uh, that brings us to the time. We're going to get in this episode, so hope you enjoy it, and send me some questions. What in the Duck Podcast is proud to be sponsored by Anchor Screen Printing. Anchor Screen Printing has been printing t-shirts and merch products since 1999. Anchor is the place for quality, small-run items. At Anchor, every print is hand-done 
by people who care about art. No mass-produced machine-operated printing done here. You can email Anchor at anchorcustoms at gmail.com to talk about getting something printed for your company, brand, or shop. Anchor Screen Printing also has its own online merch store that sells Elm Street Tattoo, Cheap Thrills, Heart and Hand, Party First Safety Maybe merch, and much more. You can check it all out now at anchorscreenprinting.com. All orders at anchorscreenprinting.com over $35 have quick and free shipping in the continental U.S. So go to anchorscreenprinting.com today and buy some cool shit. Or you can click the link provided in this podcast to shop now. All right, well, we're here at uh, Mio Tia's Mexican restaurant. Possibly, you know, it's up for debate, best Mexican restaurant in the world. Here with Blake Schwarzenbach uh, from the band Jawbreaker. Happy to have you. Really happy to be at the restaurant with you, Oliver. Thank you so much. Waiting on uh, the combo plate. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna wait till after we finish talking to bring the food out, and you don't want to eat and talk at the same time. Okay. So, um, well, anyway, um, Jawbreaker is playing a Dallas tonight, and I was fortunate enough to get a hold of you and get you here. So, thank you again. Uh, my first question, basically, this is pretty informal, so we're just gonna kind of fly off the hip but my first question uh obviously without needing to overstate it i'm a huge jawbreaker fan i know that's what most people that interview people they always try to open up with that you know whenever whoever they're interviewing whatever actor whatever they oh i love you know but anyway um the song sluttering uh the girl that was about my question is has she heard that song 100 times that's a good question. It's two girls. Two girls. In the, yeah. 50 songs each. In the world of They've the heard song. It, each one has heard it 50 times. I can't say, but I, I can tell you this, that in the event described in the song, yeah. I did go to one of the people's houses and nail some of those lyrics in an original journal entry to their front door in a blood-smeared note. <laughs> Uh, see, that's what you want to know. This is what people, this is what young Jawbreaker fans want to know. You really, um, yeah, you hit or people, gold there. People like, that were young, like myself, back in the 90s. Um, they've had enough time to read it 50 times each at least. But yeah, I mean, so you're, are you fairly certain they have heard the song? I would think so. And when they heard it, they knew it was about them. That I, I can't, I would, I think it's pretty precise. Yeah. Yeah. I would think that if I was in said situation, if I heard that song, I'd be like, well, I'm not going to listen to this song again. But maybe, maybe they just love the song so much that they had to keep listening to it. The song describes a kind of romantic triangle gone awry. Yeah. So, and because there was a lot of masochistic behavior in that triangle, perhaps they would listen to it as 50 or 100 times. Yeah. Well bridging from that um i just really i mean i listen to that album a lot and i just always think that i always think that every time i'm like if you hear this song a hundred times you know but uh it's any- a good sing-along now i know that that's when people start shouting god it's the fucking i mean i have i have made i would say that i have made so many jawbreaker fans by we playing that at the tattoo shop while we're tattooing people. And that song comes on and everybody in the shop is like, you know, and people are like, who is this? You know, because, and then people become Jawbreaker fans because of how much we are all into that. All right. Into that album. And in, I mean, all the albums particularly, but a lot, one of the places that you, that in my life have learned about music is at the tattoo shop, whether I'm working there or going to another tattoo shop and working with other people and listening to music they listen to, or going and getting tattooed at the tattoo shop and listening to the music gets played there. Um, and I think that's partially, you know, music and tattoos to me go together s- s- pretty tightly. Um, I never am I tattooing without music playing. Mm-hmm. I mean, the idea of that is that is asinine. To sit there and do tattoos for hours in silence when just a buzz is crazy. And to lay there and get tattooed for hours without music playing is also crazy. So it's like, 
it's the one thing that you go do that you just that you're exposed to a lot of music. If you're getting a whole back piece by someone, you're going to lay there and get tattooed for 20 to 80 hours. It's a lot of music to be played. Yeah. You I know? mean, it's such a profound physical space when you're first time I was tattooed. Like you don't forget that because someone's doing something to your body for the first time. You know, all the anticipation of how much is it going to hurt? <laughs> um, you remember kind of locks you into that room. It's a very deep memory. So I would imagine music being a soundtrack to that experience would be etched. It is. And a lot of people get music related tattoos. And I mean, a lot. Every day at the shop, somebody's getting a song lyric or artwork from an album cover. You know, a lot of Pink Floyd tattoos. I got my sweetheart of rodeo. Of, I've done that tattoo a handful of times. And, you know, somebody comes in and they want that tattoo. What do we do? We put that album on. Nice. You know what I mean? If somebody's getting, you know, whatever whatever band they're getting tattooed, unless it's something that I don't like or can't stand, like, we'll put it on. Like, oh hey, somebody's getting Pink Floyd tattooed. Put on the put on the put on the dark side of the moon real quick, you know. But uh, or whatever it is. Um, so it is it is a very keen place for people to learn about music, and that's why I brought that up. Like people learning to be fans of certain bands by what they're exposed to while they're getting tattooed. It's a profound moment in their life to get the tattoo. And not all tattoos are profound. A lot of people just come in and get a little doodad and they're gone. They don't remember what happened. But um, for heavily tattooed people, music is a big part of it. And people that, you know, I have a lot of band-related tattoos. I, I know. <laughs> I've been there for some of them. Yeah. Um, I did get, I did, if you remember, you tattooed Dear You on me. Uh, one late night, one crazy wild late night in Dallas, Texas. Um, that was my first time behind the gun. Yeah. Have guys, you, how many have you done since? You guys were uh, were kind and gentle masters in instruction. <laughs> how many tats have you done since? That uh, that was the last one I've done. I right. did a couple little you know stick and pokes yeah. along the way. Yeah. That's well, it. You know, I always, every time I'm on tour with the band, I always think like it would be really cool to like we're set up tattooing sometimes in the green room or sometimes in the bus or sometimes wherever close by, like have a chance for the fans or some fan or somebody to get a tattoo. You know, Ben has done it a bunch from Lucero, but he gets so he's, you know, sometimes he's drunk enough to just go along with whatever happens. But he's tattooed quite a few people uh, and he finally retired and said he wouldn't do it anymore because he was he messed he messed him up. Okay. He messed a few up and he's like, I can't do that to people anymore. And people are begging for it. But can you imagine? You know, people would love to get. I mean, I've got tattoos by a lot of my favorite musicians, and that's kind of like one of my you know things I love to do. Um, is co convince people who don't do tattoos to put a tattoo on me. I love it. I love that project. <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't drink anymore, but when I drank, that put me in a place where I felt I could do a tattoo. So we were fortunate oh, to meet you, when we did. You were so confident. You are just like, let me see how this works. I got it. <laughs> now, I don't have that. It all was stripped away with my artificial courage. Now I'm like, you know. Well, how long have you not been drinking? Uh, pro it was about a couple years after we met. Yeah. At, uh, at your shop. That was a wild night. It was. And not <laughs> and sadly not the wildest of that trip. That was a, like a, a very misguided solo tour. The oh, only man. one I've ever done. It was great. I mean, for my my brief interaction with that tour, which was one night, I thought it was phenomenal. Um, that was a highlight for sure. Yeah, the I mean the the show was great and the night was great. Um the funniest thing about that night is I came we ended up at, back at my house super late. And uh, I don't. It was who knows what time it was when we came home, and uh, Audra was asleep, and I was like, I came to bed. And she's like, "Is there?" She's like, "Oh my god, what time is it?" And I'm like, "She's like, was it, was it cool or whatever?" She asked me something. I was like, "Well, Blake's on the Blake's in the other room. <laughs> Blake's sleeping here tonight." <laughs> she's like, "Okay." Surprise, I brought him home. <laughs> Kidnapped him. Um, that's the only solo tour you've done. 
I did one in in Europe uh, on that same in that same era. I mean, truth be told, I was in a pretty radical manic cycle at that point, which kind of kept me going, but also like I was just burning everything in my wake. So, I mean, you were in a small car loaded to the gills, <laughs> yeah. just cru just kind of zigzagging around. I'm amazed I stayed on the road and <laughs> yeah, I was buying records everywhere I went. I was filling the trunk up with vinyl. We were just talking about people that just buy stuff on the road. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Um, so you quit drinking. That's been, I mean, I don't even know how long ago. That's seven, eight years ago, maybe. Yeah. I spent about six years for me, but right about a, a year before we jawbreaker got back together. That was kind of part of it was like, we're going to do this. Well, I got to get my act together a bit. What happened first? Um, deciding to not drink, deciding to get the band back together. They were like most things kind of coincidental. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, Adam and I were talking about, is this the time where everyone has the space in their life and has, has figured out enough stuff? I had just gotten out of jail. And uh, so I had to change something in my life. Well, uh, one of the big things that I, in the, in so far on this podcast, one of the big things I talk about is life changes. You know, everybody I know that is an interesting character or, ha or that is, that, that I'm drawn to in my life, whether it's in whatever genre, like it's the people that have gone through major changes, you know, the kind of people that have never had super highs or super lows. I don't want to say anything negative about people who've never had trauma, but the, the most interesting people come from the most adverse conditions, you know? And uh, I know you've probably, I know you've probably lived three or four different lives. Yeah. You know, from, from the things that you've gone through, ups and downs. Um, forever, people were talking about when is Jawbreaker going to get back together, you know? And it's like, you were quoted as saying, it'll never happen, you know? And when I met you the first time, I was dumb enough to be like, when's Jawbreaker getting back together? And you were like, hmm, I don't know. We'll see. And I, in, in my head, I was like, they're thinking about it. <laughs> like, the fact that you said, we'll see, just made me think that you're thinking about it, you know? Instead of saying, like, no, nah, it'll never happen. Because you would... Whether you're misquoted as saying it'll never happen or not, I don't know. But it was a very common conception. Uh, yeah. I mean, I did th feel that way for a long time. When I had a n another band going, it was easy to say it's never going to happen. Because yeah. that's where I was putting all my energy and enthusiasm. But it was um, interesting that they just things kind of cleared in that year before Riot Fest. Yeah. And when they came to us it just happened that each of us had space in our lives we'd kind of just finished something traumatic truth told like each of us had been through something pretty profound and we were recovered enough from that thing to be like i think i could do this right now yeah and uh so for my own sobriety like having that date to look forward to and be terrified of yeah you're gonna be in front of a lot of people and a lot of great opportunity to fall on your face kind of kept me focused and I was like, all right, that's good. That's a good kind of um, northern point to aim for. Well, I was lucky enough to be at that show. And it's, the second I heard that y'all were going to play that show, I was like, we're fucking going no matter what. You know, and it was, it was, a, it was phenomenal. You had your trailer there with, I did. with Jay. I did. Right, were you with Jay Maskus? I wasn't or? with Jay, but I had, I knew some people who knew some people and I know one of the guys that was, part of Riot Fest, one of the, not the top two, but one of these guys. And then he got me in touch with the top two guys. And I was like, hey, I want to come out. I've kind of got this plan for Jay to tattoo me while I'm out there. And they're like, oh, bring your RV, park it in with the catering. And, you know, so we got this all access deal and it was really cool. And I did get tattooed by Jay Massis that weekend, which I'd been trying. I'd known Jay for a long time and I knew his manager for a long time. Same manager as Lucero. Um, and I had been trying to make this happen. And Jay was very apprehensive. Um, but his manager was like, we got to make this happen. This will be great. It'll be cool. Like, it'll, it'll, you know, maybe it'll spark some younger interest in Jay, in Dinosaur Jr. I don't know what, whatever the case is, but not that I'm some 
you know, bring in and spark to anybody's life. But it was really cool, say the le- say the least. Um, but uh, I found out y'all were playing before I knew John was here. was playing, so I made the plans. And then, then once I found out Jay was going to be there, I hit up his manager and said, "Hey, look, I'm going to be at Ride Fest. Let's. This is the time to make it happen." And it ended up working out. And I knew some of those guys that were in the the back behind the scenes of Riot Fest, all great dudes. And some of the same people are also affiliated with people that put on Coachella. And for years, some of the people at Coachella were like, next year, we're trying to get Jawbreaker, you know? And they were like, it was this conversation, who was going to get Jawbreaker to get back together or whatever. And uh, from my, my knowledge about those kind of things and, and the band itself, money wasn't going to be the only answer. It's going to have to be something more than just money to make that happen. Like you said, there was a time that it just ended up being right. Because if it was only money, it could have been the year before, the two years before, the three years before when everybody was talking about it. Yeah, we said no a lot of times to uh, pretty pretty tempting, I mean, generous offers. Yeah. But I, no one wanted to do it if we weren't going to respect the band. And like we didn't want to shame ourselves or just do a kind of run through. It had to be for real. So it, it meant for us like a seven or eight months of rehearsals just to kind of get back to the place where those yeah, 30, muscle 20 memory years, kicks in. 20 years is a long time to be off of something. A long time. And and we rehearsed back in San Francisco. And so it was kind of good. There was an environmental reinforcement to it of like, this is the town where most of these songs started. Um, yeah. And after a few practices, it kind of started to feel – actual muscle memory was kicking in. We yeah. talk about it like now my arm knows what to do on that part. It, I couldn't write it down, but it's doing it. Wild. Um, with that being said, stuff like that, it's like, I, I feel like every all three of you guys probably never lost love for the music. You know, you probably, whatever there was tumultuous that, you know, caused y'all to go 20 years without having it. Um, I mean, I feel like for you, from my point of view, you you never stopped. I mean, when Jets Brazil started, it was like to me, it just picked up right at the end, of, right after you know, musically, it kept growing straight from the end of Jar, Jar, Dear You, straight into the three Jets Brazil records, which I also love, of course. But I thought that. And I didn't, I didn't know it was going to happen, um, but I liked that the last song on Dear You was an acoustic song with a more sung vocal. And later when we did the first Jets record, I thought that there's a through line. You could kind of hear it picking up, yeah. as you said. But also, no one stopped playing music. I mean, Adam no, and Chris no. both had bands right away, and, and we were all in music this whole time. Just That's the thing. Nobody, nobody hated being in a band you know, or hated playing music or whatever. So I think the, the 20 years, time heals all wounds. We were in too deep to like our whole communities were based on music. So, yeah, you know, there was no way out really other than a play through. <laughs> well, I got to ask you, uh, what is the, what, what's your take on the people saying that you're hard, you're hard to be in a band with that. I'm hard to be in a band with. Yeah. Who says that? people really just peeps um i'm not saying they said it yesterday but i'm saying they said it a long time ago they did no one from my bands though (laughs) if you're in my band i think i'm listen i was the difficult child that's what i mean in jawbreaker originally yeah but now i've become kind of the mellowest guy in the band (laughs) yeah i can see that we we all, I think, marvel at it in our own ways that everyone's role shifted since we've been back together. Well, it's got something's got to shift, right? I guess so. I just didn't think I would be the voice of the mild voice in the room because I used to be a little like um, impetuous, shall we say? Like I think I had some tantrums. Yeah, you're a very particular individual. Hey, I always thought about a pretty, pretty um, gregarious, outgoing guy. I when, mean, in the, when in the social world, you know, like people are surprised that it were a funny band. Oh, because yeah. Because the music seems very somber. Or well, I, 
I think that you are very, I think there's a lot of comedic writing in your lyrics. And I think there's a lot of jest. There's a lot of sarcasm. There's a lot of wit. There's a lot of like, and what, what people of my generation who grew up listening to all the, you know, discord and SST punk rock stuff. And, uh, when then once you start listening then once i became a jawbreaker fan that was like the first band for me and my generation that had like a lot more intelligible lyrics for the age that i was in 1988 you know 89 87 88 89 you know i was listening a lot of you know descendants that's you know it's like i don't want to grow up stuff you know and then jawbreaker comes out and there's a lot of like really crafty writing a lot of really witty stuff and a lot of you know just a lot more lyrical genius for lack of better words and i think that it's kind of spawned a whole new generation of of songwriters in that genre you know there was the bob dylans before that were very crafty and witty and well-written people um but there wasn't a lot of that in punk rock to me I don't remember anything other in punk rock that was like that. And that's what drew so many people like myself, you know, and as Jawbreaker progressed and by the time it got to Jerry you, it was just, that's why, you know, you, some bands people love, and then some bands, the crowd screams every word, you know, Jawbreaker is one of those bands where the crowd is screaming every word. We had, uh, my mom came to our show in Denver few nights ago and uh that was her takeaway was she was like i they know all the words it's so funny to turn around and see everybody saying the, your words did i and i never really thought about it that way but yeah and oh. you don't you don't hear it as much from the stage yeah. i know they're singing along and but uh it was you know i, I was pretty happy to have my mom see that yeah that, it's pretty cool and she loved it she had a she had a good time um, what is your mom, what are your parents' musical taste? Well, my dad was a country fan and I know, I mean, I know Hank Williams from him and, and Sweetheart of the Rodeo. He was, they were both kind of first generation hippies in Berkeley. They'd run away from Pasadena, California, and were trying to do something different than. How old are your parents? Uh, they're now seven mid 70s they were they were young so same age as my parents and my parents are that same generation yeah so they were kind of the first of their crew to leave town not not get a job right away um got pregnant early had to make it work and my dad was studying architecture at uc berkeley um, but they were also you know smoking dope and listening but there was to a music. lot of there's a lot of northern california based country-ish music you know even credence yeah you know, was from that area and and mostly influenced by country music they, i think they were just exposed to that all the music that was being passed around then one of their friends worked at leopold's records and was bringing home new albums uh, but yeah they let you know as a kid there was always fun beatles of course but i i really remember my dad liking the kind of country singer songwriter types and um so that stayed with me growing up. But I always liked people who could kind of write a story and have a some linear tale in the song. Yeah, I was raised on Merle Haggard and the Beatles, basically. The two main things that my father loved. Now, Merle is my favorite guy, but I had to find that myself. Oh yeah. I don't know I don't know what the song was or the gateway, but once I kind of His heard voice. Great voice, great guitar playing. Oh, God. And just the lines are so funny. Like that guy is this has got that kind of aching sense of humor that's like it's tough <laughs> and some heartbreak yeah very bittersweet yeah some of the best i mean i uh you know stereotypically being grown up in texas everybody's like country music country music you know and i i do love country music i love you know this the standards the johnny cashes and the you know the but merle to me like I remember it from a child, you know, uh, just being, I don't know how you don't like it. 
if and it's there's a lot of a lot of that is borderline rock and roll country music you know the 70s stuff um but for for people my age that like either listen to punk rock or listen to heavy metal or listen to this and don't like country music i feel like that's basically you know obviously that's where it all rooted from that you know Merle, Merle Haggard always makes me think of Warren Oates, the character actor. Yeah. You know, they have that same like hangdog suffering bastard look. <laughs> and like they could see the wisdom and the humor of a kind of tragic fool. And that's his songs always have that funny self-awareness. So that was part of my, the draw for me. He's, he's a character in a way. And he did. He was writing characters for those songs. They weren't always him, you know. I think he thought that was funny. Like I know about Oki from Muskogee. Everyone just assumed it was him. Yeah. But it was like, well, I'm capable of writing about someone I know, but who's not me. You know, people, writers are capable of that. <laughs> well, it, and, and that, in that era, it was, you know, it was a lot of storytelling, you know, a lot of story, a lot of songs, even the, early, you know, a lot of the Beatles got into that era. Of, of storytelling music also for a little, for a little, for a few albums where they were like, you know, a lot of story songs, um, instead of just, you know, instead of so, not so much about a, not a heartbreak song or not an emotional song or not just a rock and party song. You're just like a little bit, and it kind of grabs you. And those are the songs that you, you remember the first line of the next verse because it's in a line of a story, you know, and that's what, um, you definitely have some of those songs. I've tried to get more into it because I kind of began to realize the freedom that comes with persona. You know, when you create a persona, you can do a lot. You can smuggle a lot of ideas in and, and kind of push things a bit. And it's funny because we started, I mean, I grew up like you probably on um, SST and Discord bands were both my favorites. I mean, that's the only way we found out of when Fort Worth, as a kid in Fort Worth, it was like, we just got the magazine, we ordered every tape out of the Discord catalog and every tape out of the SST catalog. There was no punk rock record store, you know what I mean? So we just order those and see which ones we like, you know, and we'd, us and me and my five friends would all chip in and all get them and then we'd all dove copies of them, you know, and then we're like, oh, this band, this band, this band, you know, and it was like, that's how we learned about a band, you know, it's like there wasn't. None of that was on the radio. None of that was on MTV. None of it was on the internet. You know, none of that. So it's like you get what you get. You figure out how to get something. Yeah, right. I mean, we and we were fortunate in L.A. to be at kind of at a good time in Discord's evolution that we could see the Minutemen every other weekend because they were playing all the time. Um, but at, at the same time, L.A. was a real punk rock desert while we were trying to start our band. The hair metal was taking over. Yeah, there weren't many venues, and um, um, fortunately, there would be these shows happening where you kind of, look, and then there would be a new ba SST band that was on the bill, and you'd see kind of a, a new thing going on. But I, I, I brought all that up to say, like, the mute, uh, lyrically, a lot of that stuff was so first person and sincerely, I am the singer, especially in Discord stuff. I am saying what I'm saying. And it took me a long time to get the courage up or the impatience at, enough to put on a, another person's voice. Say, now I'm writing as a, a character. You well, know? That, that, that 80s punk rock was about making a stand and what we believe in and, and screaming, this is, this is what we believe in, you know, kind of the Ian McKay kind of, you know, stance where everything he says is him saying it, you know, instead of it being like a story tell. Um, but yeah. then as a kid, you take that on and you're like, yeah. Um, so I, I was thinking, I thought it wasn't really, it was disingenuous or unethical to put on a shroud and to be pretend. someone else. Yeah. And I came to later on really love that, especially in Jets to Brazil. Like there's a lot more psychedelic kind of persona. It was a little more Beatles inspired of, you know, or guided by voices or like pick, pick these bands where it's just suddenly you're writing in another character's voice and more yeah. writerly. Honestly. And and the uh, oh, there's a lot of story in Jess Brazil songs and the Forgetter songs like the about the robot boy and all that like that's like a just a a like a dystopian nighttime 
story, you know, it's, but it's, it's like a bedtime story, it's a little morbidly done. <laughs> uh, but it's, I mean, it's, it's pretty cool when, a, when you can follow one artist of any, of whatever genre of music or art or whatever, you can follow one artist across a long arc of a career and see, you know, how that, how that flows out and how the changes and what's, you know, what, what are the common denominators or what, what still is the same? You know, if you, I feel like if you just turn on a hat and just change instantly, you're going to, you're, you're cutting yourself off, you know, but if you just slowly grow, cause I known bands that were like rockabilly and then they just, the next week they were heavy metal, you know? And it's like, there's, they totally just stop and totally restart something totally new. And you can't follow that arc as a, as a fan of that artist or whatever. But if, you know, something like a Picasso for his whole life, you follow the changes. It's pretty cool to see, you know, just to grow, you grow with the, with the, what you're a fan of, you know, along the way. And especially when you start listening to a band when they're young and then you keep listening to that same artist over the course of 20 years and their, their music grows and you grow and, and then there's bands like Descendants that just stayed exactly the same. And like the new album sounds like it was recorded in 1989. And not whether that's good or bad or whether you like it or don't like it, um, not a lot of growth, not a lot of change there. Not that that's, I love Descendants. It's one of my favorite childhood bands, but I didn't get a lot of life growing with that. Hmm which is different from if you start listening, you listen to Bob Dylan for the course of 20 years, or you listen to, you know, whatever, whatever you like that's been going on that long. Um, I love the Rolling Stones, but also it's like, it's, there's some great songs and it's great music. And it's, I can listen to dozens of Rolling Stones albums, you know, every week for the last, my whole life. But there's not a lot of, uh, it's like party good times music. There's not a lot of like, not like, it's just not my favorite thing in the world. I do love it. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to, I'm trying not to be negative about anybody <laughs> being negative. Um, well, I think, I mean, the experience I've had with following a writer that, or uh, an artist that you like, when they surprise you, it's really exciting kind of with it with a second or third act um that seems like organically them they're in there they're in the new shell but they have a kind of different skin you know that if you can maintain some core identity some persona but travel through different phases maybe bowie was the best at bowie. that right like it was always him but could change styles without losing his self without losing it it's a big thing that voice like, is in there you're like oh this is that same very intelligent observant arch kind of persona driving this new vehicle but you could pick one bowie song from one place and pick another bowie song from the next place and play them next to each other and it's like polar opposites but all those chain links are there you know from that song to this song if you listen to the whole arc of his career you know and uh, I think he was probably one of the most prolific, prolific at doing that, at changing um, without losing, without, without missing the steps, without, I guess, without deleting what, I don't know if that's the right way to say it. Um, well, what I I don't think he lost any followers in his changes is what I'm saying. No, nobody quit loving him when he changed. You know, that's the not that what people whether people love you or not is the main reason to do it, but um, just incredible what he was able to do over a course of a really long like my whole life. Yeah, inspiring. And I think I mean I think the righteous part of that is that everything in this business and in kind of top down capitalism tells you it all happens when you're young and it's there's no place for an old man and seeing an artist who can make a career go long and stay engaged in new music like Bowie just used that example was always listening to bands and you know working with Trent Reznor finding what was happening 
the danger in music is is forgetting that music is why you're there. For me too, Jawbreaker stopped because we weren't making enough music. We were just doing too much petty bullshit, you know, too much bureaucracy and managing a brand in a way where we were totally unprepared to do that and yeah. had no interest in doing that. And so I, I take a lot of courage from artists who like stick around and they, you're like, oh, you can, you know, life doesn't end at 30. And um, you can have a long relationship with your, your instrument or your voice. And I think it's good for people to see that for young people, especially where it's like everything tells you, you better do it now because you're not going to be relevant when you're over 25. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a terrifying world out there for young people. Uh, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people just either stop for one reason or another. You know, a lot of people run out of inspiration or they just, they want to do something different or they want to settle down or they want to, you know what it is. They want to just, but you see people like, like Merle Haggard who like playing until the day they die. And people are like, I can't believe he's still playing shows. And in my mind, I'm like, what else is he going to do? Yeah. Like or Bob Dylan. I mean, what that else? guy tours more than most bands. Yeah. But what else would he do? Like if you told Bob Dylan, you can't go play concerts, what would he do? Like, is he going to just going to be a golfer now? Like, what's he going to do? I don't know. That brings up the whole question of like, what is retirement? Why is the whole American work dream to re to stop working? That's because like, they hate what they do. Yeah, you hate what you do. Yeah, you hate what you do. And um, you got to, you know, music is one of those things that you could, obviously people have proven they can do it until the day they die, you know? And most most real people, most real artists that I love do do that. You know, I saw, I saw Johnny Cash, you know, a couple of years before he died and he was barely, I mean, people are like, I can't believe he's, he could barely do it. He could barely stand, you know, set him in a chair and they had to help him in and out and hand him his guitar. And, but it was amazing. His voice was beautiful, you know? And in my mind, it's like, there's not, what else would he do? Why wouldn't he be doing this? You know? And it's, whether it was to a huge crowd or a small crowd or whatever, what else are you going to do? Like, I'm going to tattoo as long as I can. You know, it's, um, I can't, what else? Same question, what else would I do? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I try to find out. I try to do a lot of things. You know, and I, I have a kind of agonized relationship with music. Like, it's not always there for me. You can't just go to it and say, give me songs. I, I'm i not a prolific person at all. I'd, I would love to be. I, you know, really envy people who can write songs just all the time. And I think there is a lot of truth to just making it be work in some part of your day, saying, if you're not getting songs, maybe you just need to sit alone with a guitar a little longer and just do the work, even if it sucks. And I'm not very good with that. Like I kind of wait for inspiration, yeah. whatever that is. And but I've I've gone down different roads. You know, I was an academic for a while, and like I like actually dipping around and seeing what else I could do. What in the Duck podcast is proud to be sponsored by Legacy Ink, the finest in tattoo pigments. I have been using this ink exclusively for over 20 years myself. It has been recently rebranded and marketed, but it has been the same recipe for decades. Real, hand-mixed tattoo pigments that heal great and last. People always comment on the yellow that I use and the yellow tattooed on me. My favorite, the Mayan yellow. I have seen countless 20-plus-year-old tattoos with the colors still vivid. Don't fuck around with all these newfangled companies with their watered-down baloney. Get the tried, true, and tested good shit. You can find them on Instagram at Legacy Pigments or email Ashley today to place an order at LegacyArtSupplies at gmail.com. Tell them Oliver sent you and receive a special discount. Don't just do tattoos. Be a part of a legacy. I mean, you've done some other, as far as I know, you've done some writing, non-musical writing. At least some. I've done academic writing. Yeah. I mean, I, I got a master's degree and did a lot of 
kind of research papers and things like that. Um, I mean, you've obviously with with looking at your 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 lyrical back past notebooks. I mean, there's a lot of uh, you know a lot of language in there. A lot of you know a lot of knowledge of language in there, and the way you write and the way you tell a story is you know different than what a lot of people have done. You know, at least in your genre, and um, you know, there's a lot of lines you know that that are that stand out in your songs. Like you were just saying, they they named something after one of your one of your lyrics. We were just talking about it on the way over here, and it was uh, what was it? What was the line? What's the furthest? What's place the furthest from place from here? You know, stuff like that. But there's so many lines in your songs that just stand out to people. You know. Um, and I feel like you, do you think of a catchphrase and then write a song around it? Or does that catchphrase just come through when you're writing a song, like flying a disappointment? You know what I mean? Like, do you, how do you, stuff like that, like that? They they all happen simultaneously. It's a weird thing. But I've, I've heard a lot of other songwriters say, like, the songs they end up, st that's, they stick with and that stick with them are often the ones that come kind of all at once or quickly. Yeah no struggle, no tug of war. They just like, wow, it just kind of happens. And I feel like the the better parts of my writing are things that happen in one one spell or patch where you're just in that place and it's coming quickly. Um, but I'll build out from, you know, a few lines and then find some, start playing and see that something that musically complements that sentiment, what's in the writing. And then those two voices, the guitar and the, and the words begin a dialogue till it's they wrestle it out till it's done. It's like a, these fit together. I just kind of imagine you like just clicking, like thinking of this line, and be like, oh man, that's a good like twist of words or playing words or a good little catchphrase or like. There's only so many of those that you can come up with, and you're saying sometimes you can't come up. Sometimes it just doesn't come easy or whatever. And then, are you just like wrestling with trying to find that next? catch or uh yeah <laughs> i don't know I, f I have faith that it'll come usually yeah. if i sit and write for a while something will, interesting will happen um i don't know if it's always going to be a song i might just be writing for myself you know writing at home and i'll usually go back over recent writing and then find the the germ of the song like oh that's the that's what you've been thinking about it's a little it's very unconscious it's like dreams or if you look back over them, you're like, oh, that's because this was happening in my life at that point. You can realize what you, your body or your spirit is wanting to say. I mean, yeah. most of, I, I derive a lot from dreams. I know some people do, some people don't. Some people are, don't have a connection to their dreams or some people don't. And I'm not talking about like, oh, I dream of doing this when I grew up. I'm talking about like when I sleep at night, I dream something and then I wake up and I'm like, Boom, you know, and what I did with my living space all came from dreams, you know, like I literally dreamed there was a van in the wall. And then I woke up and told Audra, I was like, we got to put a van in the wall. She's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and now there's a van in the wall. <laughs> um, and I feel like if you're that kind of person, you know, I feel like Dolly had to be that kind of person. You know, I feel like. You know, a lot of people that are just beyond creative, you know, that just, that stuff has to come from dreams or psychedelics mm -hmm. or combination of both. You know what I mean? Um, when I was a young artist dr drawing and painting and doing a lot of psychedelics, I definitely like controlled the style of things that I was coming up with, you know, it was mostly based on the the LSD that I was doing at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and visually, that makes a lot of sense to me, the way I think. And I know a lot of musicians do the same thing with whatever substances or whatever control, whatever kind of mind experiments they're doing, control like how they, what things that come out. I, you know, I found that really true with uh, marijuana. I was a late bloomer, but I started smoking weed when I was about 40, 
for the first time. I used to make me too scared and paranoid, too much reflection. And then like a light went off and the thing that really happened with it was color. That's when I really started painting and drawing. Um, and even the words were colored. Uh -huh. Like there was color to the words, which was always there. I felt innate and in them. But I had a purely psychedelic experience with pot. I think because I'm bipolar and it kind of kicks that part into overdrive. So what, I loved it. What about the creativity side? Did that spark that too? Or? Absolutely. No, I would just smoke a little dope and I'd be happy all day. I would just sit there with paints and instruments and play in my apartment. I didn't want to go. I wasn't social at all. It was like, I want to make stuff all day. Yeah. Loved it. I can't do it. Like it's not sustainable for me, but I miss that first honeymoon of learning <laughs> weed exists. And you know, oh man, how old are you now? <laughs> I'm fifty six. So you're yeah, I'm fifty. I'm fifty two. So you're four years older than me. Uh, man, that's like, ah, uh, I got I got sober and got off drugs and alcohol when I was uh, twenty one. So I did all my all my wild experimentation in a very short like two year period from 18 to 20 two or three year period from like right, right before i turned 18 to right when i turned 21 um but that really it stuck with me for a long time you know for the next 15 years i was able to access that the memories and and that mindset of being stoned or being or tripping on acid or seeing things in that light. I was able to, especially in my dreams, you know, my mind had that ability. I'd given my mind that ability with all these psychedelics that I had done. And I retained that ability for a long time. Um, and I think without, without doing it the age I did, it would, I would be way different. Um, but I'm also glad that I was able to get away from it early enough. I did end up going to jail and it was a long, you know, you know, it was a low point in my life, but it turned, turned things around and it was good for, me. it ended up being really good for me that I ended up going to jail and having to quit. Cause otherwise who knows a lot of friends of mine, you know, spun way out of control on harder drugs and harder drugs and harder drugs. <clears throat> but yeah, but I think that's true though, that, um, I remember, so, I think what I found really exciting and beneficial about weed in my case was the cognitive leaps you would make um you know you're way more daring your mind is more daring and in color um choices that would be repugnant to some i could find beauty in these abrupt alignments between two colors that shouldn't sit side by side everything kind of blends and it might be your own trip completely but i found like I was finding something and I still, if I'm writing well, I think I'm kind of getting tapping back into that. You retain that ability. Yeah. To, as for you that were mindset. saying, that yeah. you can do these kind of brave leaps of like, Hey, it's not nonsense. There's a thread. There's a connection here. You see that connectivity. And uh, that's the part I liked. It's mm -hmm. like finding that. But I don't think, I don't think you need to do LSD every week for your whole life. You know what I mean? <laughs> I think that, you know, to, to gain the ability to see that part of the, of the, of your inner self, like you can do it and gain that ability. And then you have that, it's like another ability that you have. Um, but I remember when I was younger and I was a big proponent of the psychedelic world. And, and if people hadn't, I remember telling this, these kids that were in this band, they were younger than me and they're like, one kid was like, I love Pink Floyd. I go, oh man, you ever listen to, you know, ever take a bunch of LSD and listen to Pink Floyd? And he's like, I've never done LSD. And I was just like, I remember telling him, was like, you've never heard Pink Floyd, you know? And he was just like, what? And I, I was just the whole summer on tour. I was trying to convince this kid. I was like, you got to do it. <laughs> you got to, I was like pushing on him to like do LSD and listen to Pink Floyd. Cause it's to me as a kid, I grew up with Pink Floyd when my parents listening to it and, and being young. And then I got out of high school and I took LSD and listened to Pink Floyd. And I was like, you know, changed my whole life. Um, and I was like, man, if this kid doesn't have that, he's missing out.
but that's just my own perception. I don't know if he's really missing out or not. Yeah. But I was so in tune to thinking that you needed that, that I was like, you got to do it. And now I'm like, mm, I think everybody should make, you know, I don't want to be the one convincing people. That... <laughs> but of all the drugs that I've known people to get on and off, LSD and, and weed are the ones that, you know, nobody's really had, nobody's spun down, nobody's living under the bridge because of it now. Hmm. I wonder. I mean, the mind is pretty... Um... It's, once, like, it's like an octopus. You know what I mean? You know how the octopus is? He's just this hypersensitized creature with so much nuance and depth, and we will never understand it. And I'm glad of that. And I feel like the human mind is kind of that thing, too. It's like, it can be really fragile. And for me, like, weed was probably like acid. Later on, a doctor told me, like, you, you under no circumstances should have THC in your system. It's spiking your, yeah. it's sending you off the charts. I was really grateful for those experiences, but I would never urge a yeah. fellow uh, manic person to well, that's the, smoke weed. The you know? crazy, then that's what I'm saying. I don't like nowadays, I'm like, mm, I probably shouldn't be trying to convince other people to do the same things I did because everybody's different. Everybody's mine. Uh, I also believe that we'll never, in my lifetime at least, I don't think we'll ever fully comprehend what's going on in our heads. There's just, nor should we. Nor you gotta let the mystery we. remain. Well, there's people trying to figure it out. Yeah. Good luck to you. Uh, let me ask you this. It's a lifelong relationship. That's that's the beauty of it, of life, I think, is is learning your mind as you go. Hopefully you can get to a place where you're at peace with one another, you know, before you quit each other. <laughs> like, well, it's been good. The body has to leave the mind at some point. What do you think about, uh, it's a hot topic right now. What do you think about the, the artificial intelligence? I, it's not my world, you it's know. Definitely not my world. I like. Um, I barely like the manually internet. Manually fabricated intelligence is what I like. I like, as Johnny Cash said, elbow grease. Yeah. <laughs> I like things that are made. I think that, um, you know, a lot of people are talking about what AI, you know, who's going to, you know, as far as like writing songs, like you can just tell, you can just type it up, tell AI to write a song about, give it a couple of care, give it a couple of names, a couple of ideas and say, write it like Blake Schwarzenbach, write it, write it like Johnny Cash, write it like this. And it'll just, <laughs> what's going to stop the young generations from who's going to, who's going to, Who's going to write the songs? Who's going to write the songs, man? Uh, I think a th a, a think a consortium in Silicon Valley is just going to. But here's the thing, okay? So everybody's freaked out about AI. I think we AI has been among us for a couple decades now in the in the form of corporate consensus. You look at our uh, first run movies now. That's all done by demographic kind of. Yeah. Well, you know, what if, what do the jury. most of people want to see? Yeah. Like the Marvel world is that's AI. That's like it's gotta have this, this, and this. And they figure out enough that'll it's a guaranteed big weekend. It's like a commercial. Like we're gonna make a commercial for this product. What do people want to know? And then they just type in all the things that they need and then they just cram it in there. Give them what they want. Um, yeah, make them feel seen and validated. And that, to me, that's a AI. It's already happening. But yeah. It's just become more um, overt and mechanical. Now it's just like all that information from all those things is all in one bank and you can just push one button. Right. We tried an, an AI, a jawbreaker AI experiment. Oh, really? See, and, I'm glad I asked this question. Yeah. Right around when the chat GPT or whatever it is was, was you could, anyone could go in there and do their thing. And we were in, um, in uh, Ohio and staying at a B Airbnb and we had nothing to do. So we were like, well, let's, let's have make jawbreaker and a Benji movie. Like Benji goes to see jawbreaker. <laughs> and we had a, the, we had to write that script and like <laughs> Benji goes to a punk fat, a rock fest and he meets some bad people. And then he meets some good people who help him. 
what we learned was the the moral of the story is friendship. Friends can come together and triumph over adversity. Um, you know, it's your kind of basic. Uh, so was this? It just wrote it out, or fodder. it made. It wrote a script. It okay. wrote a, it wrote a um, an outline of a script to pitch to a studio. Benji goes to Jawbreaker. <laughs> it's kind of like Lassie on the Moon, oh, like the camper so. <laughs> uh, well, I feel like a lot of people are over the last, especially this last year. A lot of a lot of artists have been piqued enough interest to to try AI in some way, shape, or form. You know, like get on there and like either create. Um, videos or photos or drawings or whatever and it's like some people most of the people i know as soon as they tried it they did a couple things and they're like nah you know what i mean but i feel like that those are the creative people that like they feel less creative by doing that and so they're like now nah, i'm gonna paint or no i'm gonna draw or no i'm gonna write music or whatever um but i feel like a lot of people are maybe the less creative of people are drawn to that because they can, maybe they, f I don't know. I don't know if they feel creative by typing in the chat GPT and making it pop up something, but. Well, they're always <laughs> looking to replace the creative class, right? They're the most nefarious uh, employee, the most unreliable. Like the talent is going to be. They difficult. are the most unreliable. And the creatives, they cost too much. <laughs> so if we could just do it ourselves, I mean, look at the writer strike, right? If we could just get these writers out of the room, we wouldn't. Have, and that's we'd the have, problem. They complaining. They Nobody. probably can get rid of the writers. They could probably do it, AI, and you know, I mean, you can certainly keep producing the kind of adult animation and all the stuff you see on television. A lot of it. Yeah, the big the big fight in AI is is that whole the the film industry side. You know, there's some crazy things they're trying to do with it, which I'm glad I'm not a part of that. So I'll say that. Um, but I just think that if it was up to me, I would. I don't want anything to do with it. I don't have it. Don't have, I don't have a place for it. Yeah, where would it fit in? I can't see it. You you have a very tactile. You work in a very tactile physical world. Yeah, I don't have a place for so, it. And that's good. Like I, I like the world of things, you know. Um, I'm a twentieth as someone once said, <laughs> I'm a twentieth century man. Yeah. Like that was my that was my century. That century was my home where where uh you could you could do things with things. <laughs> Very interesting times. Um but you uh back on the back out of the AI world, um Y'all have been on tour for a little while now. Um, are y'all back in the studio anytime soon? No plans. No plans. Y'all were recording stuff. What two year a year ago or? Uh, we we've been doing some practices where we'll get together in a town and just see what happens. Try and do some kind of writing. I know y'all recorded a little bit in Memphis. Mm, just or, just practices. Yeah, just you know, just ideas. Okay. Yeah, nothing to speak of. So no plans for that. Not not any heavy ambition on that front. I mean, we'd love. I'd love to have new. We need new songs. We all know that. Like we can't tour the catalog much longer. But where are they going to come from? Where? That's well, that's the question. So maybe maybe touring inspires that. Um, meeting friends and you know having new stories, or maybe we take a year off and just start writing writing. Very cool. Well, I've, the onus I feel is a little bit on me because I got the word part of it. And so they're like, you know, maybe come in with some songs, Blake. And get it together, Blake. Yeah. Once again, falling <laughs> down on the job. You know? Man. Well, <laughs> back on um, a, a momentous thing was the 30 year anniversary of the album Dear You. And you did the whole tour where y'all played the whole album. We did. I mean, that, I mean, you made it first, you had a comeback, which was a big deal. You know, and then what, two, what's it, I guess three years, two years later, it was the 30 year anniversary, maybe. Is three, that right? Three years. Three yeah. years later, it was the 30 year anniversary. Um, and man, I, I don't know how you, I know a lot of bands that kind of like 
don't like the idea of playing a whole album. Uh, some bands do it quite a bit. Um, I love it. I love the construction of an album. I never listen to songs by themselves. I'm an album person. I like to, I like to put on an album and play it from start to finish. And, and most of the time, if there's a, if there's only three or four songs on the album that I like, I just never listen to that album, you know, but the albums I love, I listen to the whole album. And especially, I don't know if what came first, but at the tattoo shop, we have a, and for 30 years I've been, you know, working in the tattoo shop and we have a music rotation. And so it's your turn. What do you want to hear? You pick an album, play the album. When the album's over, Jake, it's your turn. You pick an album, you know, and then I pick an album. And so you just get, I'm missing that album mindset. So when I get to see a band that I love play the album front to back, it's like the best show to me. Um, years ago, Cheap Trick played Austin. And they played three nights in a row, and they played a full album each night. I went to two of those nights. It was phenomenal, you know? Um, so when Dear You was going to be played the whole album, that was like the coolest thing. I had tickets, going to the show, jaw, Jawbreaker with Lucero opening in, I think it was Brooklyn or something. It was in, on the East Coast, and or maybe it was Ashbury or something. Could have been Atlanta. But it, no, it was on the East Coast. It was okay. on the upper, upper, up in Brooklyn area. And then it got canceled. Oh, the hurricane. Right, right. Got canceled. And I was so bummed. It's like broken hearted that, I was, that that show didn't happen. Um, but luckily, y'all made it up. And then I went and saw I think Detroit. I saw the show in Detroit where Lucera opened. Okay. It was great. It was like still kind of tail end of COVID. So it was a weird weird show that whole tour was the, the yeah plenty of covid going around yeah i saw i i saw you for a second i don't know if you remember you were going in and out you're like um but nobody was allowed backstage nobody was allowed anywhere it was like everything was all so it was uh still a great show but just very weird time to go to live music you know everybody was chomping at the bit to see live music but everybody was like you know, in a lot of places, a lot of bands weren't playing. A lot of clubs weren't letting it happen. So when it did happen, the crowds were just like so stoked to be there. Yeah. But you had to jump through all these hoops to get in and out of places. It was a whole added layer of grind to touring for that. It was a pretty long tour for us. It was like six weeks. Um, and we had to, yeah, that those added layers made it much, much harder Uh from Just your a, side, it was probably less enjoyable. It was. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot, we had a lot of great shows, and, and we played the hell out of it. Like, I think we worked really hard to make it happen, but you didn't get to see people. You couldn't hang out afterwards. A lot of us got COVID by the end of that tour, and we were, by the very last few You shows, had to get it. We were just dropping like flies. Like, we lost our tour manager. We lost our second guitarist. So we were we were stripped down to the three piece again. The last show in Nashville was just the three of us. We're like we're, we're all that's left. Well, you had a lot of those shows were booked before, and a lot of those shows. I even think the show that I saw in Detroit was was part of the remake. Was the makeup? I think if I remember correctly, it was should have been earlier, but then it got delayed. Um, and then it was like even the week before. It was like, is it still going to happen? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I went to Detroit specifically <laughs> just for that show. And so I was like, when I, I went to, I flew to Cleveland and me and my buddy from Cleveland drove there. So I, when I flew to Cleveland, I was like, I sure hope this show doesn't get canceled. I'm like. They, you know, there was structural problems with St. Andrews Hall in Detroit. And they moved the show. And they had to Last move the minute. show because they, they were having, it was dangerous. And so we went, we was in Pontiac. Where it snowed that morning, curiously enough. And, and we it, drove in the snow from Cleveland to get there. <laughs> it was pretty wild. We saw everything on that tour. And at the beginning of that tour, we kind of thought we were going to get that window. COVID was light. It was it had lifted. And people were just starting to venture out. And it was like, wow, we might be in that perfect Gulf Stream of like between the two strains. But we kind of got caught. We, we got in. It was going well. And then, yeah, we, you know, because it kept kind of germinating we got caught 
Well, as a band, were y'all isolating amongst yourselves this whole time? Was it on the on that trip? Or yeah, just in, yeah. On that on that di- then, during that time of touring. I mean, we were all on a bus together. So you ha- you're and you're we, in close quarters. We had to test in and out of the bus every time we did a drive. And um, yeah, it was like you know it was fairly rigorous. So any day, it's cl- it's canceled. That's the yeah, a lot riding on it because it's really expensive. You're hemorrhaging cash anyway being out there. Then if you can't play the shows, you're you're pretty screwed. And a lot of my friends had bands that were <clears throat> once twenty twenty one ended. They every band needed to tour because they'd been off for a year and a half or more you know, and just out of work, basically, you know? And so, like, we need this show. Like, we can't cancel. We can't cancel. So that was a very, I can only imagine what y'all were, the stress levels of that tour. Had to take some of the the fun of being on the road out of it. it we were pretty done by the end. I mean, we were ready to take some time off for sure. And I think the people that really got impacted, we'd had a couple good years of being back together. And like none of us really earned that much money anyway. So like having played a bunch of big shows, we we had a buffer to ride through COVID for a few years, but all the crew was like it was dire. They couldn't work anywhere, you know, yeah. and they and they work for multiple bands. And so yeah. I mean, I had, you know, friends in the in the sound industry and lighting industry and all they were like driving uber and they were doing whatever they could there's no jobs for a long time that was re- i mean it was it was such a kick in the dick to the music industry and the club industry and the restaurant industry it was such a just insane time to live through i feel like uh i don't know we're you know and talk about it for the rest of our lives, probably. <laughs> I, at least we should start because yeah. you know, once it stopped, nobody wanted to talk about it. Yeah, it's still out there. Like I don't, th- I don't. We get the process is an overused word, but I don't think anyone is really contented with the time we almost died. Yeah, like you kind of go back because I was in New York in the beginning of it, and that actually felt like, you know, you it could happen. You, the and the, scary. the different mindsets from different parts of the war, of the country were very crazy too. Like I had friends that lived in Italy, and it was like just the end of the fucking world. Yeah, people live in New York, end of the fucking world, and then people live in Dallas, like woohoo, whatever. You know, like mm-hmm. it was like there was pockets of places that it just it was seemingly not happening, and in other places it was like. Ah. So it's very hard to like really process for a long time, like what the other, what, what's really going on. Cause there's so much information out there. And one of the things I say to people, is like, whatever you want to believe, there's proof for it. So if you want to believe this, I can, if I have a stance, I can pull up all kinds of things on the internet to prove you that I'm right. And then the opposite view, exactly the same. Like whatever stance you want to believe on, there's proof for both sides. So it's like, it's it's such a wild, you know, t- I like getting people's different takes on what happened and what, what they went through. And um, Yeah. And I mean, from where I was sitting in Brooklyn, it was pretty irrefutably at the end of the world. I'm just getting testimony from frontline workers working in Queens and, you know, at at these hospitals that were overwhelmed. So I took umbrage at some of those people who said otherwise that we don't get your panties in a twist, you know? Um, I felt like we were at ground zero and I know I had friends in Italy who also felt that way. Yeah. But the, then I can see that in more sparse populations, less, less contact, it might seem totally different. Well, I mean, they say in New York, Unless you're in the middle of an intersection, you're never more than like 20 feet away from another person. Because if you're in your apartment, there's somebody 10 feet above you, somebody 10 feet below you, Absolutely. somebody 10 feet to the next room, you know. Uh, it's pretty wild. Yeah, I lost a couple of people in my building, my downstairs yeah. neighbor. And it was spooky. You know, you just see an ambulance show up and then you realize it's quiet downstairs. Whew. Wild. Um. I like the, I like where we are right now. This is a good 
to the deep silence. <laughs> well, <laughs> sometimes you need it. When's the combo combo play coming? Um, any minute. Let's see. Uh, what are you feeling like? I got the. I mean, I always get the. I like. I'm. I'm kind of a man of many senses, so I like to have like the enchilada, the taco, and the chili relleno. Oh yeah. With rice and beans, and then that little salad with the like Russian dressing on it. Oh, the chili relleno. Gotta it's good. It. Oh. It's good. It's just is it good house, here? house specialty. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I grew up on LA Mexican food, and so the chili relleno featured prominently. <laughs> but also that iceberg salad with the Russian dressing. We don't dressing. have the iceberg. No Russian dressing. That is real. That's no key. <laughs> no Russian dressing. That is key. <laughs> well, man. Um, yeah. What else? What else you got to tell me before you get out of here? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. You know, the question with no question. That's a big one. What do I have to tell you? To come to the show tonight. Oh it, man. It will have happened two months fr from when you hear this, but, uh, I will be at the show tonight. I am very excited. Um, uh, I got a couple friends coming. Um, but I'm, uh, we're promising a surprise. There's going to be a surprise track tonight in your honor oh so really? a classic cut i think we're gonna we're gonna trot out for this event oh really yeah holy mackerel <laughs> should i be nervous <laughs> we're not gonna put you on a, a spot on you or anything okay i can handle it i can handle the heat um blake thank you so much my um, pleasure i really uh i mean you know uh without me saying it but i'm gonna say it anyway I'm a huge fan um, and of the music and just meeting you has been, you know, something, uh, something really cool in my life. I really appreciate it. You're such a, you've been such a genuine person in the, in the few times that we've been able to hang out and it's just, uh, it's really cool. It's really refreshing and a lot of, you know, meeting, meeting someone that you've been listening to for so long, it's like, you never know how it could go, you know? And you just, uh, I'm just amazed. I'm really appreciative of uh, you giving me an hour of your time. And I'm stoked for the show and uh, stoked for whatever else you got going on. When's, oh yeah, next, last question. When's the Just Brazil reunion? You know, we got asked that a lot now and I, I can't say. I can't speak for the other Jets. But you didn't say it's never going to happen. I didn't say never. Yeah. No. How many? Better but you had, not saying you never. had, didn't you have, was there two bass players? In Jets? Yeah. Uh, no, one bass player. Oh, only one bass player yeah. the whole time. He was, there were two guitar players. Okay, two guitar players. Um, At the same time or well, replace one replace another? Uh, We, No. Same same lineup the whole time. We had we had a first a, a Pete from Lifetime, that band. He was our first second guitarist, and then Brian from the Laps uh, became the second guitar player. So he played on the the next two records, two and three of Just Brazil. That was Brian. Well, I would love it. I would love it. A years ago, I was on Warp Tour and I was tattooing a guy who was playing bass. I can't remember his name, but I mean, it's the bass player. Uh, what's his name? Jeremy. Yeah. Yeah, Jeremy and I kind of started that. He's he he's was my co play, at the time on Warp Tour. He was playing bass in a band in a band that was on tour. Like I, oh man, it might have been like Helmet or something. It was Helmet. I yeah, bet it was. Yeah, he was playing the Helmet, and I was tattooing him. And about halfway through the tattoo, I found somebody said something and the, the topic came up that he was in Jets Brazil and I like lost my mind. <laughs> oh, he was probably pretty happy about that. I was like, oh my God, you know, because um, at that time, like I love, I mean, there's been times, you know, how things come and go and, you know, you like one thing and then, you know, but at that time I like Jets Brazil more than it was, I would say that. Orange Rhyme Dictionary was my favorite album out of your catalog or whatever. And people were like, oh, no, man, unfun, or oh, man, this, or oh, man, that. And I'm like, whatever. But anyway, it was cool. 
he was a really cool dude. He's a super cool dude, and he and I, he that that was the germ of that band. He and I just wrote together for a while before we got the rest of the band. So. He was he was, f- and uh, I mean he's a fucking amazing player. Great musician. I'm not I'm not to say anything negative. I'm not a fan. I wasn't a fan of Helmet before, but I mean he's he's a mate. He was a ama- that their live show was pretty pretty awesome. Um, and I've. Yeah, so call them up. Yeah, all right. Well, we'll see. Everyone's got a family except me. <laughs> um, I don't know. Have you, you never had any kids? No kids. Hey, I don't know how you feel about it, but the fact that I never had any kids is is probably I feel like it's one of the best things, best decisions I ever made, or best happy accidents I never fell into, or whatever. Um, I love kids. I, I, I love hate my, kids. I love my friends' kids, but um, yeah, I was just never in a place where I felt confident that I could do my job as a parent. I'm Ooh. sure that I know that kicks in when you, the protective stuff, but that's what I've people just been say. trying to make myself feasible. People say, Oh man, you should have a kid. You'll love it. And I'm like, yeah, most things, there's a lot of things that if you do, you'll love it. Like try heroin. You'll love it. I guarantee it. <laughs> and I was like, I don't want to try. I don't want to have kids. I, I don't want to love it. I don't, I don't like my cousins, my nieces, my nephews. I don't want nothing to do with them. Like my, my, they're always trying to get me to come over uncle Oliver. And I'm like, nah, you don't, uncle Oliver's not fucking PG. I was like, when they turn 21, I'll take them, I'll take them to fucking Vegas or something. But I don't want to, I got no business around 10 year olds. Sure. What am I going to do with a fucking 10 year old? What the fuck am I going to do? So I could see uncle Ollie being pretty, pretty exciting. I mean, if you want, needs a wild uncle, if they want to go ride dirt bikes or go to the go-kart track or something, I'm totally in, but they're probably going to get hurt. And I am not responsible (laughs) when it's time to go to the hospital. I'm like, you're out. Sure. Then you just call in the folks with the station wagon and say, get them out of here. Every time I've been around young kids, they end up, they're having the time of their life and then they end up crying. And then I leave and I'm like, I'm out of here. So with that (laughs) note, I'm out of here. (laughs) All right, buddy. (laughs) Good to see you. Awesome. Thank you. What in the Duck podcast is proud to be sponsored by Label Solutions. www.labelsolutionsinc.com I've been a customer of theirs for over a decade. They make the highest quality premium labels for all kinds of products. Food and beverage, personal care products, pet care products, beer and wine spirits, CBD products, automotive products, and more. They can make a label for almost anything. Multicolor, custom die cut, full wraparound labels, too many options to even tell you about. I use Label Solutions for all the stickers and labels for my stuff like the Tiki Loco label on the coffee I'm drinking right now. They do have a minimum order of 1,000 labels, so they won't make you 20 labels for that soap you're making in your bathtub. But if you've got products to label, you need Label Solutions. Get started today at www.labelsolutionsinc.com.